Imagine an America where you could just go anywhere by train. One where one could pick from four daily options from Pittsburgh, each arriving in Columbus some six hours on. One where twice daily trains left Denver, track south, then climbed through the most rugged reaches of the Rockies, providing passengers a selection of dozens of destinations that today can only be reached by the most reliable off-roaders. One where the same sleeper that left Washington on a Monday or Wednesday or Thursday or Friday would pull into San Francisco on a Sunday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. One where even Hawaii had trains, linking the south of Oahu to its north, stopping at countless coastal communities along the way. One where one could go from Indianapolis to Nashville, or Albany to Burlington, or Dallas to Denver, or Boise to Spokane, or anywhere to anywhere. An interconnected, frequent, reliable, affordable nationwide network where all it took to travel anywhere was a quick walk to your town's local station. This America existed. In fact, if you average America out, if you examine the country through its most persistent configuration, this is America. The development of the nation was so deeply intertwined with the development of the railroads that if anything, today, the blip in time since World War II where automobiles have come to define the landscape, that's the aberration. Trains are the norm. This average configuration of America can return, but before, it has to recognize the minor yet monumentally meaningful mistake that took it off track and into today's exceptional, irrational reality. The rise of American Rail was as meteoric as it was chaotic. Bolstered by favorable loans, cheap labor, and with full-fledged federal government support in the form of land grants, the back half of the 19th century saw American Rail mileage nearly double for three consecutive decades. The result was a nation quickly over-indexed with a maze of mismatching rails. The race for critical market share was rash, bordering on irrational, as companies ran redundant rails into cities, dropped rates to bleed others dry, and, in the most extreme cases, even took up arms. But the frenzy launched an industry which in turn built a nation. The craze couldn't last. While railroads became the nation's second largest employer behind only agriculture, and nationwide rail mileage would continue upward into the next century, the industry began to mature. Expansion for the sake of expansion gave way to efficiency-focused consolidation. This shift in approach was best epitomized by J.P. Morgan. In 1869, Morgan entered the industry with the purchase of this, the tiny Albany Susquehanna line. But rather than expand lines, he looked to cut unnecessary costs and inefficient practices. In the following decades, the Gilded Age financier reorganized companies, ended rate wars, and removed duplicate routings, hoovering up railroad shares as he went. By 1902, the maneuvering had wrestled Morgan control over an estimated sixth of all American railways, streamlining services to maximize gains. While atypically successful, Morgan's focus on efficiency was hardly unique. As his empire grew, companies like Great Northern experimented with route optimization. By employing heavy trains, focusing on maximizing car loads, and only running at full capacity, the railroad pulled higher revenue at lower costs, an approach that made railroads increasingly popular to private investors across the US. Through the expansion era, the rails had become central to American life. Like post offices and town halls, rail stations were staples of every downtown, and day to day, the average traveler and business owner alike steadfastly relied on trains' consistent, constant availability. Through the consolidation phase, however, as track gauges standardized, companies merged, and financiers looked to maximize profits, rails also became critical wealth-generating machines for the American capitalist. Effectively then, by centuries close, the rails served two masters with divergent purposes. The American public who required their passenger and freight capabilities, and their investors who poured money in with the expectation that efficiency gains and optimization would create more money. From the jump, finding the balance between these two purposes was tricky. With the arrival of the combustion engine, it became nearly impossible. The reasons behind American Rail's decline are well established. Affordable automobiles, improving roads and highways, and increasing consumerism sent passenger rails plummeting. And it wasn't just cars making things worse for the rails, but trucks. Freight now faced its first real competition after World War II as American trucking companies operated on interstates, moving increasingly diverse goods from increasingly dispersed factories to various alternating locations. Rails simply struggled to match the flexibility and convenience offered by the roads. In a car-centric society, passenger service was becoming less viable by the year, and while rail was still the king of heavy freight, it would need to make adjustments in the face of its first real competitor. 
Yet, while the writing was on the wall, iconic passenger lines, the Rio Grande Zephyr, the Santa Fe Super Chief, the Great Northern Empire Builder, continued to run through the 60s. It was entirely counterintuitive. In a 1967 government report, officials concluded that for every dollar of revenue a carrier would lose if discontinuing a passenger service, it would save from $1.45 to $2.42 in costs. But the rails didn't run these routings because they turned a profit, they ran them because they had to. The Interstate Commerce Commission, established to ensure that the rails continued to provide service for the American consumer, in this case by maintaining important travel corridors, made it practically impossible for railroads to abandon passenger routes no matter how deeply unprofitable. Since the creation of the ICC in the 1880s, the rails were closely monitored and heavily regulated. Now, yesterday's safeguards were choking them out. Railroads cut infrastructure investment, winnowed down their lines, entered risky mergers, and filed for bankruptcy. By the late 60s, the industry was on the verge of collapse. With a vitally important cog to the American economy on the brink, the federal government decided to step in. The idea was simple. Give the rail companies a chance by getting out of their way. Through federal grants and loans, the Department of Transportation figured the government could prop up a public corporation to provide passenger rail rather than counting on the freight lines to do so. And by maximizing profitable routings in the Northeast Corridor and elsewhere, they figured, the front-end investment would lead to the service breaking even within four years. For their side of the bargain, the railroads would hand over their passenger stock and would allow the new service to use their rails for a fair rate. In 1970, Nixon signed the Rail Passenger Service Act, and Amtrak went from concept to reality. Looking back, from an industry perspective, the Amtrak deal and deregulation worked. Rail shed their passenger lines, they abandoned their unprofitable freight lines, and they consolidated and consolidated and consolidated until only four major companies held major claims to American rails. Things went less well for Amtrak. To its designers' dismay, it didn't turn a profit in its first four years. In fact, it didn't turn a profit in its first 50 years. Instead, it became a punching bag. Its brutally slow and infrequent long-distance lines exemplified how far American infrastructure had fallen, and its lack of punctuality served as a far too common punchline. Depending on one's political perspective, the part government, part private passenger service's lack of success is a function of too much government intervention or too little. But a critical factor in why Amtrak fails to be on time, to be consistent, and to make money is a function of a tiny bit of legislation everyone has seemed to forget. Between Amtrak's creation and the further deregulation of freight lines in the 1970s, America passed the Amtrak Improvement Act of 1973. It wasn't a major piece of legislation, just one of many acts under the same title that didn't make headlines, but it resolved what had become a confounding issue between Amtrak and the railroads, who had preference on the lines. And in no uncertain terms, it solved the confusion by stating that passenger service had rail preference over freight, effectively that people had the right of way. Or it tried to solve the problem. Amtrak thought it solved the problem. But here's the sticking point. While the law exists on paper, passenger service priority is rarely granted in practice. Amtrak trains today, and for decades, have been at the mercy of railroads' erratic, inconsistent, and inconsiderate scheduling. The rail companies claim the issues of matter of interpretation, Amtrak points this glaring oversight out time and time again, while the Department of Justice, which by the letter of the law is the only body that can initiate any sort of enforcement, has shown no interest in addressing the issue, only ever initiating one lawsuit on the matter in 1979. Basically, giving the railroads the benefit of the doubt, their interpretation of the industry-saving bargains fine print has put American passenger rail in an impossible bind, but given how they're run, it's hard to give the railroads the benefit of the doubt. While on the surface, freight rail might look like a natural evolution of its predecessors from a century ago, down below, the industry has reinvented itself as it's become fixated on a series of seemingly practical but in actuality misguided operational metrics that have led its management down a path towards constructing the weakest, least competitive form of freight rail in American history, and they've taken passenger rail down with them. For example, gross tonnage per train. The more freight carried per train, the better, right? Well, longer trains are cheaper to operate. In fact, that's perhaps the paramount factor in freight rail's incredible cost competitiveness. 
One can just keep adding and adding cars, and with each addition, the average operating cost per unit of freight goes down as there are few additional marginal costs for added weight or length. This is all true in a vacuum. To actually be able to increase their gross tonnage per train, companies had to simplify. With nearly boundless options of origins and destinations all across the nation, it was simple math. They had to reduce the number of route permutations so that more traffic got aggregated into fewer routes. To accomplish that, they took advantage of the newly deregulated business environment to negotiate massive volume deals and focus on simpler types of freight. And they got really lucky. You see, as America introduced more and more air pollution restrictions, coal users increasingly shifted away from dirty Appalachian and Eastern coal and increasingly towards so-called clean coal from the West. With that, there was no longer the sprawling Mississippi River system and its lower cost barges to compete against. Rail was the only practical way to get the fossil fuel from Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, and beyond to the population centers in the East. And coal is the perfect customer. Most mines can easily fill hundreds of hopper cars within a matter of hours, meaning a given train only has a single origin and a single destination. No complex, costly, labor-intensive sorting cars in rail yards. And even better, the demand is huge and predictable, often multiple train loads per day per mine, so today, some 27% of freight rail tonnage in the US is represented by coal. Through this operational simplicity, the freight railroads were able to lower their rates far below what trucking could compete with. They had created a competition-proof market segment, and this methodology could be replicated elsewhere. In concert with the deregulation of freight rail, America and others increasingly outsourced manufacturing abroad, and so rather than originating in Ohio or Indiana or Illinois, consumer goods increasingly originated in Shanghai or Guangzhou or Ho Chi Minh City and entered the American supply chain in a small number of massive container ports. Similar to coal, this simplified operations. The aggregation was already done for them, as ships dropped off 10 or 15 or 20,000 containers at once, so all the railroads had to do was pick up a couple hundred of them and point east. It was hub to node rather than node to node, so costs, like with coal, went down. As capacity was increasingly consumed by large volume commodities and intermodal containers, there was no longer the need to serve the needs of more minor customers. The era of sending a locomotive to haul a couple cars from a trackside factory to rail yard was over. Volume ruled supreme, so railroads cut costs by closing smaller branch lines to and from smaller towns. Unless, of course, they had mines. So the new geography of the rails and the dominance of volume combined to concentrate and enlarge the traffic on the rails, which made the infrastructure on which it operates worse and worse again for Amtrak. Today, not only are there more slow-moving freight trains to get stuck behind, but management's fixation on their all-important gross tonnage per train metric has meant that they've started running trains that are too long for their own infrastructure. Rail sidings are specifically built as stoppage points to let one train pass another, like a faster Amtrak train stuck behind a slower freight, but with the new supersized length, some freight trains are physically too long for their sidings, meaning there's sometimes no physical way to respect the already disregarded Amtrak rail priority. And this is only one so-called productivity metric that has held Amtrak back. Perhaps above all else, the one that management fixates on most is their operating ratio. That is, operational expenses divided by operational revenue. Today, across the board, this is at an all-time low. Whereas a decade ago the industry average sat at 71.6%, today it's at an unbelievable 60.4%. This is heralded by management as a massive success. They've refined their craft to such an extent that 40 cents of every operational dollar is pure profit. But here's the thing. It is very, very easy to make long-term sacrifices to boost short-term profit. Dismantling a line when it's underperforming, even when that line might become useful again in the future, boosts short-term profits at the expense of long-term competitiveness against the trucking industry. Deferring track maintenance boosts short-term profits at the expense of long-term efficiency as operating speeds have to be reduced to assure safety on poor quality track. Electing not to expand busy corridors boosts short-term profits at the expense of long-term revenue due to additional potential traffic not captured. Freight rail management have made these short-sighted decisions time and time and time again, extracting value from the infrastructure invested in far before their time because that's what the structure incentivizes. 
Short-sightedness is inherent to the decision-making process in private industry. Those in charge have an incredibly short window of time to build a legacy, and infrastructure, at least in the 21st century, moves slow. This presents a challenge unique to this form of transportation. Air, sea, and road freight all rely on in-route infrastructure that either exists naturally or is built by the government. Nobody wants to be the CEO that decides to sacrifice decades of profit to build a new track to boost revenue 30 years on when they, their colleagues, and their stock options will be gone. Everybody wants to be the CEO that boosted stock prices by delivering the lowest operating ratio in history. Freight rail can do what freight rail wants to do. It might be a structurally flawed industry, but as a private, deregulated sector, it's their right to be structurally flawed. But there's still that one tiny, minuscule law that marries this private, deregulated sector to the American passenger rail experience. The tragedy this presents is that Amtrak can get better, by the law it should be better, but the network on which it operates is owned and managed by a pair of duopolies whose incentives inherently push them to make the system worse and worse and worse. Opportunity exists today. For example, the Colorado Front Range. This is one of the strongest unrealized opportunities for passenger rail in America. Before a futuristic, long-shot world of dedicated high-speed rail all across the country, the realistic near-term potential on the front range is greater than almost anywhere else. This narrow, linear population corridor has coalesced along the plains leading up to the dramatic initial ascent of the Rocky Mountains — Pueblo, Colorado Springs, Denver, Boulder, Fort Collins, and Cheyenne. These cities, in aggregate, represent one of the fastest growing regions in America, with 16.7% more people counted in the 2020 census than the 2010, and disproportionately, the influx is driven by the younger demographics that are most demanding of passenger rail. To boost the case further, the corridor is home to a sizable collection of colleges with carless young people, and the two largest, CU Boulder and CSU, sit away from the biggest population center and airport in Denver. The one major highway connecting it all, Interstate 25, is constantly at capacity, leading to crippling slowdowns, and the tracks to remedy this all already exist thanks to Union Pacific and BNSF. Amtrak's already timetabled it out. They think they could run service from Pueblo to Denver in 2 hours and 43 minutes, then the stretch from Denver to Cheyenne would last 2 hours and 51 minutes, each slightly longer than the 2-hour driving times, but not by much. Faced with traffic, parking fees, and loss of remote work productivity while driving, plenty enough would elect to take the train to run four per day according to Amtrak's market analysis. It's not a perfect step, but it's a step. Amtrak has already identified dozens of other imperfect steps across the nation. Three daily trains from San Luis Obispo to San Jose can work today. Two daily trains from Los Angeles to Las Vegas can work today. Three daily trains from Phoenix to Tucson can work today. Four daily trains from Chicago to Louisville can work today. Two daily trains from Atlanta to Nashville can work today. Three daily trains from Chicago to Green Bay can work today. The tracks exist, the customers exist, the economics exist, but the problem is freight rail. The track priority law matters. According to Federal Railroad Administration analysis, improving on-time performance outside of the Northeast Corridor just to 85%, just to a level that would be considered poor in the rest of the world, would reduce the company's annual operating loss by 30%. With less loss and more profit, fares could go down, capturing more customers and more revenue, leading to a virtuous cycle of improvement. But perhaps even more importantly, in the transportation business, passengers' time matters. The rail development opportunities that exist today are genuine, but they're narrow. They're not the Northeast Corridor. They're not going to usurp the airlines. There are a couple trains a day capturing a couple hundred people in corridors with millions. They'd serve an incredibly narrow slice of the traveling public, those few that can be convinced away from flying or driving, and these are those incredibly rare places where that slice is big enough to justify the trains. So what can't happen is for that slice to get smaller. When a three-hour train turns into five, that slice is the slice, and Amtrak reliability outside of its own tracks in the Northeast is awful. 
In 2021, of the 15 long-distance trains traversing America on freight rails, the best on-time rating was 83% on the route from Chicago to New Orleans. The next best was 62%, then it got worse and worse all the way down to only 28% of travelers arriving on time on the New Orleans to Los Angeles line. While theoretically Denver to Cheyenne in just an hour more than driving is a decent proposition for some, that's only if it's consistent. Getting stuck in a siding for an hour to let a freight train roll past is the perfect way to turn a skeptical first-timer into a vocal advocate for widening Interstate 25. Timeliness matters for passengers, but the freight rail industry willingly and purposefully decided to seed the timely freight market. They decided it was too hard, that trucking could have that business, and that they would focus on the slow stuff, coal and intermodal and others. So they've created a system of infrastructure where timeliness doesn't matter, where they dispatch trains wherever they want, where they defer maintenance, let tracks go derelict, and impose speed restrictions, where they fail to expand congested corridors because the trains will get there when they get there. Increasingly, freight rail and passenger rail in America are incompatible, but because of that bargain struck decades ago, freight rail has the infrastructure and passenger rail must use the infrastructure, so decisions are made time and time again that manufacture a network that make it harder and harder to get back to that golden era. The vast majority of Americans want a rail system like Europe or China or Japan, but that's an incredibly difficult proposition to take on. According to most, it's when we should, but to start, America can make that imperfect step. It can get just a little bit better before it gets great. It can use a little momentum to make it easier to get up to speed. But before anything, the country and its legislator needs to recognize the inherent and increasing incompatibility of passenger and freight rail. The two industries are at odds, and for the benefit of both, some sort of change needs to happen so we can stop imagining and start experiencing again an America where you could just go anywhere by train. You might remember how back in late November, the US was facing the potential of a crippling freight rail strike. The contributing factors to this are pretty closely related to what this video is about. In an effort to cut costs, management has consistently reduced average staffing per train and implemented regressive working pools. For example, due to the imprecise nature in which these railroads are getting run, staff are required to essentially be on call non-stop for weeks at a time so that once management decides a train needs to go, there's always someone to drive it without prior planning. Now, the way I stayed up to date and informed about this dispute and the potentially catastrophic hit to the US economy that would have ensued if the Biden administration hadn't forced an agreement was through our sponsor, Morning Brew. Every day, I wake up to their newsletter in my email inbox, which provides a concise, clearly written, interesting overview of the most impactful stories in business, finance, and tech. It's far better than the alternatives of dense and often boring traditional news or the Twitter doom scroll. It's made to turn the first few minutes of your day into something productive and fun that will make it so that you know what you're talking about when current events come up in conversation later in the day. And believe it or not, this is all free. This is pretty much the easiest ad read I ever do because there's literally no reason not to sign up and give it a try. So click the button on screen or in the description to subscribe for free, especially since it not only will make you a better informed person, but also help support the channel.